get started. <clears throat> Everybody, class, class. Anybody remember that Cheech and Chong bit? Yeah. Why don't you do the punchline? Yeah, no, thanks. I don't want to deafen everybody. Um, all right, so thank you very much for coming um, to hear uh, me drone on about probability in cyber risk assessment. Actually, this isn't me droning on. It really is. Um, it's it's going to be a little bit different, and, I, and I'm going to confess something to everyone that I'm incredibly nervous right now. I'm not usually nervous doing these things, especially since I'm getting feedback. How do I do? Good. All right. So, <clears throat> all right. Because this is a new way for me to actually do a uh, do a talk. Usually, it's me standing up here droning on um, for you know whatever the time is with some uh, with some Q and A at the end. But this time, I'm doing this a little bit differently, um, and I have and and what makes it a little bit more. Uh, Tenuous is that I have uh, clients in here and I have friends in here and I have friends that are clients in here and clients that are friends in here So uh, That's the same thing anyway, so without further ado welcome everybody. Thank you for coming um, I do want to let you know that this is actually a very interactive discussion um, It's really more like It's not a presentation. This is think of this as like a uh, birds of a feather session that you would go to at, at a conference. We're gonna hopefully have some good discussion uh, around this topic of uh, probability in uh, cyber risk assessment. So the idea here is that I'm not going to uh, kill you by a death with PowerPoint. Um, however, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make a confession. There, there's one slide in, in this presentation that you're going to hate me for because it is a horrible, awful eye chart. And uh, I apologize, but we'll, we'll try to we'll try to get through to it, through it together. So the way that I thought this would work is I'll give some of my perspective and some of what drove me to submit um, the the idea for this paper um, into RBA set and kind of set the stage, and then we sort of move into the discussion stage. So. Please, for the love of God, now let's wholly participate. Because if I hear crickets out there, you're going to see me melt. <laughs> and it won't be pretty. Um, so we discuss and uh, share your experiences and your thoughts with the group. And uh, we'll, you know, hopefully there are Austin Powers fans out there. Um, feel free to jump in, um, though, as I'm kind of going through the slides. Again, this is interactive. If you do have questions, <laughs> you know, this is actually my favorite. You can't see him, and, and here is Alex Trebek. But my favorite Will Ferrell sketch ever is, is that sketch. Um, <clears throat> so first, I have to do a disclaimer, which is for my protection and yours. Um, these are solely my opinions mine personally, that they don't reflect my employer, who, you know, I also own part of the company and I collect a paycheck from, but they're, they're, they're Josh Cole's opinions. They're, they're nobody in, in the rest of Asura. Um, in fact, uh, we've had some lively debate about this very topic uh, internally. So everybody, everybody grok that? Mine. Okay? All right. So for those of you who don't know me, I am a Los Angeles Dodgers fan, and they are playing the Chicago Cubs today at Wrigley Field. That was actually taken last year uh, about this time on a uh, baseball trip that I took with a friend. So you can see A.J. Ellis's beautiful mug in the background on the big old scoreboard. So um, I've been doing uh, uh, work in the cybersecurity realm for 20 years. I started when I was with uh, um, Electronic Data Systems, otherwise known as EDS. And um, now they're part of Hewlett Packard in some capacity or other. Um, I think I still have some money in the 401k there that I need to roll over, but I can't remember. Um, <clears throat> so I've done, throughout my 20 years, I've done literally hundreds of risk assessments. Um, and some of them have been uh, better than others. They keep, every time I do one, it gets better than the last one, which I'm proud to say. 
Um, so w I'm not going to bore you with any a marketing spiel about this, but I, I'm also the primary developer of a risk assessment methodology called Calibrated Risk Index. If you want to hear or know more about that, I'll be at the booth after this and tomorrow. So you can come and hit me up about all that uh, about that, and I will be very pleased to expound on all the wonders of it. But this isn't a sales job for for that. This is um, inform hopefully informative. Um, I've been a guest lecturer at Virginia Commonwealth University and at University of Richmond and like tons of other industry things. And I also um, teach CISM prep. And I have one of my students in here from my last prep course as well. That's awesome. Love that. So <clears throat> I have been thinking. Um, and it's probably a heresy for a bunch of you sitting in this room that why do we keep trying to determine the likelihood when we do cybersecurity risk assessments? And this is this has become less of a rhetorical question for me than an actual sort of thought process. And so partly this is, I'm waiting for somebody to, to jump in and yell, Josh, you're wrong. Um, because I, I, it's been known to happen once or twice. Um, but but I, let me kind of, bear with me here, just kind of hear me out, and then, um, let, and then we'll, uh, we'll talk more about it. So just a quick refresher um, about um, risk. Uh, risks are a common, you know, a risk is a combination of threats, vulnerabilities, probability slash likelihood, um, and impacts. And then, of course, residual risks are all those things when you factor for controls that might be in place, whether those are technical, operational, administrative controls, what have you. So everybody, anybody disagree with this? Okay, good. <laughs> all right, let's do a quick thought exercise. Here's what I want everybody to do. I want you to think about a recent zero-day vulnerability. And let's maybe th think about it as a, everybody's favorite whipping boy, Adobe Flash. Because I don't know about you, I love Adobe Flash. Um, OK, so think about that, whatever, whatever that zero-day is. And when it was announced, you did a quick risk assessment on it, about it for your organization, right? Right? Yes, everybody did one. I'm sure. Nobody does one. Come on, let's get real here. <clears throat> so the first thought you had, probably, if you're like most people in our industry, was, wow, we need to get that patched right away. Because you don't want you don't want your organization to get hit. So what I'm gonna ask you is what probability method did you use to derive a picture of risk for that zero day? If you're like most, you probably didn't do that step or simply defaulted to Guess what? It's a high risk, right? You, anybody disagree with that? All right, good. Why? Because for, why did you? Why did we do that? Why did we skip the step or automatically default to it being it's a high risk? And in my opinion, the answer is because likelihood and probability are really, really difficult. It's very difficult for us as security practitioners to get our arms around. I know it. I know it is for me, because in order to derive a probability of something, you have to have a lot of input. You have to have a lot of data points, and you have to control for. And each one of those data points is a variable, and you have to control for those for those variables. Okay, and sometimes we just don't have enough data to make good to have good probability, um, to, to make a good probability decision. So maybe let's try to figure out a bit of the probability of this risk. And let's, let's take a look at the data. This, let's assume you have 10,000 workstations and laptops in your environment. I'm sure there are several people in here with that level of, um, that, that, that many endpoints. As of yesterday, and this literally, I, I looked this up yesterday, um, there are approximately 1.03 billion websites out there in the, in the world. 
and that's uh, that's from uh, um, internetlivestats.com. And if you haven't looked at internetlivestats.com, it's fascinating watching those numbers. Um, so let's just a quick quick division problem. You basically have a work uh, website to workstation ratio of 103,000 to one. So um, of those websites that are out there, those over one billion websites, how many are compromised and are going to again using our Adobe Flash? Um, Zero day exploit. How many of those are poisoned? How many how many ads in an ad network might be poisoned? How do you anybody have a guess? I sure as heck don't. I have no earthly clue. And I have no earthly clue how to even tell what that number is. We may be able to get into degrees, maybe. I don't even know if we could get into a ballpark. Maybe we could get into a, a, the geographic region of that. But there's, there really is no way to tell. Even if you had a worldwide sensor network, like a lot of the, uh, the, the big MSSPs do, and you were looking at that data, even they don't know. It's like predicting the weather, right? So um, then think about this. How many of your users are actually then going to potentially go and surf to a, a poison website or get hit by a drive-by when they're on their, you know, when they're looking at Facebook or um, name, name your favorite website, um, you know, Google, right? <laughs> so what's the probability that we're going to get hit? It's a likelihood. It's a likelihood. 103,000 to one. Right. You could, uh, Potentially. Absolutely. Somewhere between. Are you filtering porn or not? <laughs> <laughs> right. Then that's a one That's residual risk. That's residual risk. Yeah. So maybe. I mean, you're okay. So you take of the 1.03 billion, you take away a billion of those. <laughs> All right. Let's uh, maybe let's take a look at this the single loss expectancy. Everybody, who who in here knows about single loss expectancy? Come on, everybody who took a CISSP exam has seen single loss expectancy, right? Okay, so what we're really concerned about is the is the probability the, the probability slash likelihood input into single loss expectancy, which they call exposure factor. And I love this definition from Wikipedia, which is the subjective potential percentage of loss to a specific asset if a specific threat is realized. Keyword being subjective. Who? So this is this one's driven me batty since I first cut my teeth in cybersecurity. Was exposure factor, and in fact, we had a client fairly recently, within the last year, who wanted to actually use this somehow as a return on investment calculation. And I was like, now let's uh, let's let's steer the car left here. So so what's the exposure factor? How do you know? It's you can do a series of exposure factors from zero, which would be zero, SLE, to through n, you know, through one, and all and all the, um, the the places in between. But you're still giving kind of a wild guess. Anybody agreeing with that? Anybody not agree with that? Anybody have a really good exposure factor methodology that they use to derive that? Starts, perfect. Okay. So here's the oldest way of, of doing it. And of course, you can read the definitions. And you know, you're you're still looking at sort of a subjective measure. Low, medium, and high. Love those. Map. Low, medium, and high are great because they map to things like red, amber, green, stoplights on, balanced scorecards, and all sorts of other stuff. But the, this, is, this is all coming down to gut feel. Here's the new NIST way, and I am sorry, this is, this is one of those eye charts. So they have um, three different uh, looks at, at the way that you sort of take a look at um, likelihood. Um, the likelihood of a, a threat event initiation, um, Threat event occurrence, if it's non-adversarial or, um, or adversarial. Likelihood of a threat event resulting in adverse impacts. So there we go, impacts. So you're looking at likelihood and 
and we're already talking about impacts in, in terms of likelihood. And then you have this lovely little grid on the lower right-hand corner that you go to and you, you meet, have the X and Y axes meet, and there you go. There's your, whether it's low, moderate, high, very high. So again, very, very scientific, right? Extremely. So getting a little bit more scientific, and this is the one, I am so sorry, folks. I apologize. I didn't know. I, this is, you know, I, I wouldn't, you can walk out on me if this is too bad. This is, this is basically where we start to get into predictive modeling. And the most common sort of predictive modeling is something called Monte Carlo simulation. Basically what Monte Carlo simulation is, you run, hundreds to thousands of um, computations through an algorithm, through this Monte Carlo method algorithm. And it uses random inputs to derive a probability of some sort. And, and usually it's expressed as uh, points on a bell curve. And so, of course, that 50th percentile right in the middle is your most likely answer. But if you, t if you read these, and, I, and I'm going to read a, a couple of them to you because I don't want um, anybody coming to me f uh, for their uh, optometrist bill. Um, so normal, or bell curve, the user simply defines the mean or expected value and a standard deviation to describe the variation about the mean. Everybody understand that one? So you have two inputs that you are having to provide and you're having to play with. So... The, the, the expected value, your expected value, and a standard deviation from it. So what, do you, what standard deviation do you put in? Who the heck knows? Log normal, values are positively skewed, not symmetric like a normal distribution. It's used to represent values that don't go below zero but have unlimited positive potential. Okay, that's, that's fantastic. You still have to provide some sort of a, an input into that that is a, some expected result. Uniform, all values have an equal chance of occurring and the user simply defines the minimum and maximum between one and n. So somewhere between one and n, this Monte Carlo simulation is going to, is going to plot that. You can see some examples of how those are used and they're actually legitimate examples. Triangular, this is the one that, I, that, that makes me laugh. The user defines the minimum, most likely, and maximum values. So you have to know what the, in, in a triangular Monte Carlo simulation, you have to know what the most likely is. That doesn't really help me. Believe me, I've played with at risk a whole heck of a lot to, um, to try to get this to, to do what I want it to do, and I can't get it to work. So maybe there's an at risk um, guru in here that knows something more than I do where the internet does. Per, that's pretty much, um, that defines the minimum, most likely, and maximum values, just like the triangular distribution, but it, it um, basically outputs them, the results in a different way. And then discrete, these are defined specific values that may occur and the likelihood of each. Not exactly helpful. So one of the things that predictive threat modeling, predictive probability needs is it needs a lot of historical data. But what we get to, hang on a sec, I'm supposed to switch the slide now, um, is we're always getting to, even if we're using other predictive modeling techniques like clustering and whatever, what we're getting to is um, we don't have enough data, usually, and also that old that old disclaimer, past performance are not indicative of future results. Just because we know what happened in the past and we have that historical record, we don't necessarily know that that's gonna be true for the future. So in the past, we didn't have ransomware. Who, now we do, okay? So who would have, who would have in their risk modeling and their risk assessments would have thought we would have been dealing with something like ransomware. We knew malicious code, but we didn't know that. We didn't know what the, the, that, that is an impact. Okay. 
So here's my question to you. What if we just quit chasing our tails on this and we just focus on threat credibility instead and we stop trying to do likelihood? Because here's my thinking on this. If it's a credible threat, does it that mean it's probable? We don't have volcanic activity in Virginia. So is volcanic activity a credible threat? No, it is not a credible threat for Virginia. It's a credible threat for Washington State and Hawaii, but it's not a credible threat here. So what we're doing, if you take a look at, this is, these, this isn't an ad for NIST or the way they do it. Your, your mileage may vary on this. But this, again, this is out of um, NIST special publication 800-30 revision one. And this is the way that they sort of break down determining whether or not there's, there's a threat. They, it has to have the capability or means, has to have some sort of a motivation or intent, and sometimes it, if you know that, it's, that you are a target of whatever that threat is, that threat's ire, if you will, then you, you can use these lovely tables, and I like these, how they say in the second column on all these, semi-quantitative values, though they're not quantitative values, they're semi-quantitative values. <clears throat> okay, so, but even if you take a look at this and use, and, and we start to move away from trying to figure out what the likelihood is, and we started to look at it more from the standpoint of threats and threat credibility and the impacts of them exploiting a vulnerability, that's really what we want to get to. That's really what we care about, right? If, if the threat is real, and we know it is, we know ransom, the ransomware threat is real, we know that zero day it, threats and, and vulnerabilities are real, then what does it matter what the likelihood is? We need to take a look at what the potential impacts are what our potential vulnerabilities are to it, and then determine what our control strategy is and whether or not it's accurate. And that, and that provides what the, the data we really need. So that's, those are my thoughts. <coughs> All right, you ready to discuss? Um, so here, I'm gonna change, change this up. Oh, it's coming? Okay. Luke, I am your father. Right. So, <clears throat> what does everybody think about what I've said? Come on. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run around. I'll be like Phil Donahue. <laughs> or Oprah. Um. I totally agree with you in the sense that I have always felt like uh, when there's a number associated with likelihood, um, I, I don't think we have any data most of the time to support it. So that I, I felt it's false from that perspective. I honestly, and I hope you're not into, I don't think you go far enough, to be honest. I don't, I don't think nowadays we have a full understanding of impact, and I think that um, I, I am a, both a privacy and a cyber person, and one of the things that I, I get pretty riled up about is a corporation will think of impact of a breach of PII to themselves, but not to the individual, right? So they don't feel like, you know, it, it's only to, well, do we have to provide coverage, you know, some type of, so I, I actually think the whole risk model is up for question at this point, because I don't think we necessarily know what the adversary is up to. I don't think, they do things that surprise us. We don't really know. I think the whole thing is up for question right now. Wow. You said I didn't go far enough. I thought, I w I thought it was going to be, like, really super controversial here. Oh, sir. Thank you. Good feedback on that one. I, I agree with you. See, <clears throat> in my opinion, all right, c before, before I uh, get to you, can I ask a question? Who, who in here has a really, really good business impact analysis that they rely on to tell them what the consequences of a risk event are? 
That's what I thought. They're shy because everyone will want to talk to them. <laughs> so I've been rethinking this uh, process and have recognized that for each of the six major phases, a product goes through before it's actually put on your machine, that uh, each of those actually are gamed. There's actually a game theory model we've, uh, that I've created as an example from the standards-based systems. Um, if you take a standard like, mm, just pick one of the ITF, or, um, IEEE, whatever, there's actually a game theory taking place to take one of those products and make it do something for somebody. You have to know who the players are, and the players are changing. Therefore, the standards themselves that are implemented may have flaws in them before the code is actually written. Then you actually have the code people that are actually part of that, that inject specific risk profiles that you're not aware of again, and there's a game theory model for that. Once it's actually picked up by the vendors, then there's a game theory that models, you know, from a business. Do I actually take, as an example, sorry, I'm known for my IPv6 stuff, but most of the products out there do not support IPv6. They claim IPv6 support, and we have 10% of the population using it right now, and we have no way of detecting it. So once it's actually implemented, you have a business model and game theory for that. Until it's actually operationalized and you get into the SIM management process, that's actually where we're, that's what you're talking about, is here's all the stuff I have in my infrastructure. Can I actually predict what's happening until we get to the end of life? So if we take a look at long tail decisions, a long tail decision made in the protocol can actually exist for 15, 20 years before it actually touches you and you're actually trying to then create a risk model. So I think what the problem is is that you're looking at a snapshot in time based on not full knowledge but partial knowledge and you actually can't define that without actually adding game theory. Does that make sense? I, I'm, I'm submitting something for RSA specifically around this topic. I'll be there. Maybe, actually, maybe you should have been given this talk. <laughs> no, no, um, no, I, actually, I think that, that there's, there's a, of what I understood of what you were saying, and I'm just going to confess, you were blowing my mind on some of this stuff. Um, the, um, uh, the, that you're, you're right, from the standpoint of standards and protocols, you know, there's, there's a, if, you, if you're not doing risk assessment um, in the in all the phases, it do, we can get left with some pretty bad stuff. Think about things like wired equivalent privacy, which was anything but. It was. It's actually re-implemented in two IEEE standards that are being rolled out. WEP is back. And worse than ever. All right. Um, any other? Good. Good. Thank you very much. Great. Good input. Other thoughts? Oh. Are you guys, okay. I, I mean, we could do like, you know, arm wrestling up here. To <laughs> um, how would you balance, so your, your credible threat and probable threat, um, I am worried a little bit about the potential tunnel vision that happens when you only focus on threats that are credible. Um, and how, so how do you balance that with wanting to protect against the most probable things, the most probable exploits? Wow, you really stumped the chump on that one. No. Um, so that is, that therein lies... <sighs> This is a philosophical thing for me. Um, so the bad guys have better imaginations than we do. And we are limited in some ways. First off, we are, we are limited in terms of, um, I think everybody in here, may, uh, hopefully I'm not speaking out of school, is a relatively honest and decent, upstanding citizen, and it's it, yeah. Well, you know, Chandos, I mean, come on. <laughs> um, 
So, so we have a limitation of imagination. So, so when we're putting together risk assessments, we're only looking at the threats that we can contemplate in the first place. I don't think that there is a magic bullet in probability that necessarily helps us to think more outside of the box about um, specific threats. However, we can think, if we think about threats maybe in a different way, in a broader sense, that might be able to, to help us. The, the problem with that is, as you go up in threat categories, like in, instead of taking a look at, in the example that I gave, a zero-day exploit, a specific zero-day exploit, and you just called it zero-day exploits, or you just called it malicious code, then you start to lose resolution on that particular um, threat on that particular bad thing that could happen. Because if you just get into malicious code as a general category of threat, that's not a bad thing. But what are the typical things that we look for as vulnerabilities and then we implement controls around? Lack, you know, we're looking at lack of malware detection, malware prevention. We're looking at, uh, you know, it on, at, on devices, um, at the perimeter, maybe even sometimes with, within the soft GUI center of our um, of our uh, infrastructures, and so when the new when the new whiz bang piece of malicious code comes out, are we really ready for it? Are we really prepared for it? Because we're still you know we're still looking at signature based um, attacks, attack detection, right? So it, did that? Yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, so so I think you know it's, and that's a. That's a topic for, that, maybe that's the next paper I'll submit in to, uh, to RVASEC is how do we, is like, how do you develop a credible threat list? That's, a, that's, that's always been a, yeah, an interesting one. Um, okay, so Chandos did have his hand up and I'll, I'll get to everyone, I promise. We're doing well on time. So the concept of a risk assessment is to help prioritize our risk and to, you know, this one's more likely, we need to go after that one. So if you remove the likelihood number, then you're not, you can't have a distinguishing factor to help better prioritize. So what is there else that we could include to actually make a prioritized list off of the risk assessment? That's a great question. That was, that was actually the one I was anticipating. If you are looking at risk and you are actually measuring risk rather than using a verb like low, moderate, high, you know, supercalifragilisticexpialidocious, then you can get more resolution into what the priorities are. If you're, could, if you're actually applying a quantitative metric to it, and there are quantitative models out there for, for risk, then, that, then the numbers that you get help you to prioritize the bad. If you can quantify impact, and that's what we're really looking at is what, what are the things that have the highest impact to our business, our organizations, then, then you can do it. So um, that, that would be my answer. I would say, and we can, you know. But an asteroid would have a big impact. True. <laughs> True. There are black swans. But is an asteroid a credible threat? <laughs> Asteroids. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not going to name names here, but I used to have. I used to work with somebody who uh, um, talked about um, emanations and penumbras from the sun as a uh, as a threat. So that was that was funny. All right. Um, hang on a sec. I had one gentleman. I'd like to go back to the uh, keynote this morning talking about uh, having uh, a lot of communication. I think you can be pretty sure if you have a wide enough variety of people that you stay in touch with, somebody in that group is going to look at every single possible risk as being credible for them. And they will be your experts. And if you ever just wonder, like, 
got a few minutes. What about this? You could ask them. Uh, NASA learned to have about 100 people on some project teams as different from each other as possible so they wouldn't have another multi hundred million dollar screw up and lose a satellite because somebody used the wrong units of measurement. Um, you can't just have enough eyeballs to make bugs shallow. They have to be different eyeballs. You have to be, they have to be people that, so you don't end up with this group thing. All right. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, <clears throat> there is room in, uh, in risk assessment and risk measurement and, and certainly in, in mitigation strategies um, for uh, consensus and for lots of diff uh, different and diverging and potentially converging opinions. Uh, that makes the organization stronger because a lot of times the naysayers get shut down, but sometimes the naysayers are the ones who make everybody stop and really think and they, and they, they provide a, a good checkpoint for, for everybody. I, I love it when people are like, well, Josh, well, what about this? And I, and I sit there and I'm like, you know what? You're right. I didn't see that. And that's, and that's part of us not, uh, as having a, a problem of, maybe it's, without getting too uh, existential here, maybe it's a, it's a, it's a pride thing. We're, we're paid to know a lot. We're paid to provide good, adv good sound advice. And sometimes, and I know I've done it in my career, you have blinders on and we don't necessarily see everything. So I'd like to get some clarity on your definition of credible threat, because I was listening. It sounds largely synonymous with likelihood, and I'm with this gentleman here. The only reason you call the asteroid is not credible is because it's incredibly low likelihood. So explain that for me. Remember when I was saying I love it when people stop me in my tracks? You, you know what, you, you are right. And, and so the, the building of, a, of, of what we would call a credible threat table, what we, a credible threats list, there is, there is a lot of subjectivity still in that. Um, there is, a, and there is, because there's experience, there is learning from those that went before us, other people who have maybe done more work in the field and more research in the field. Um, so at a certain point, all risk, there, there, there is a squish to it. There is a subjectivity somewhere along the, the chain. And I think that what, what, I'm, what I've been kind of thinking is there are those two points of squish. There's the point of squish of, um, of the threats, and there's a point of squish of I, and that's a scientific term, by the way, squish. Um, and there's a point of squish when it comes to um, probability as well. And so being more of a numbers-driven guy, um, maybe to my detriment, there, um, I'm, tr I'm really trying to just pull out some more, so as much squish as possible. But you're right, there, there, there's, a, there's a judgment call there on even on creating a, um, you know, a list of threats that we're going to assess. Part of the impact, uh, are you actually defining constraints? Let me give you an example. Behavior versus signature. The amount of blocks that I can put on the firewall before the firewall becomes a denial of service or the router. Or how many signatures can actually be loaded into a virus protection before the vendor removes them. Um, identifying those particular constraints based on Goldratt's work in, in constraint modeling. Um, is something that we're missing also in risk. As an example, one that you were talking about, um, um, uh, black swans. Um, some of the black swans were predictable based on things that have happened in papers that came out in the 60s and the 70s that we don't go back and read from a risk modeling standpoint. Anybody have feedback about that? 
I think what occurs to me as I, as I start to process this is the, the classical definition of likelihood has always been based more on internal factors, internal to your company, internal to your network, and does the possibility exist for credible threats to be more of a industry level or a shared definition uh, where it's calculated independent, independent of maybe your specifics but general characteristics and expand it that way as we get into more of a community-based threat modeling. I think that's a fantastic idea. Because threat intelligence data, um, I don't know how, how many folks uh, here work with or have worked with the federal government. They have the best intelligence apparatus in the country, I, I, you know, except for you know, maybe there are a couple of private companies out there, but we don't know about them. Um, and, you know, they're, they're bad at sharing threat intelligence data amongst themselves, and they still fight that, and they still deal with that, even though they have, you know, things like fusion centers at Department of Homeland Security that are supposed to, supposed to knock down the walls for threat intelligence sharing. And there are ISACs out there that are, that are sponsored um, throughout industry. And it's, so it's getting better, but, yeah, I mean, a, a, an industry... An industry threat, a uh, uh, cross industry threat sharing, cross vertical threat sharing, I think is great. And there are there are really good um, for those in the healthcare sector. Um, the High Trust Alliance has really good threat intelligence briefing. But again, they're they're just looking at what's being reported from their membership that are, that's in the medical community. That still could apply to the financial services community or the retail community because guess what, hospitals and doctors' offices take credit cards too. Yes, sir. Uh, just a quick observation on the point you made and then a follow-up question. I promise they'll both be quick. Um, first of all, one thing I realized, I think, coming from this conversation is that, you know, we, we've seen earlier today that, that there are difficulties with information sharing and so on. And you're talking about challenges with understanding likelihood and that it's all guesswork and all that. Somehow those two problems seem to... it. it to one way potentially of convincing people to share information is that they would have perhaps improved likelihood and uh, threat credibility estimates. So that's just a quick observation. Now to the Bayesians. Uh, I, so I, I, I noticed that you, I'm, not, I'm a frequentist myself, but I noticed that you, um, you know, when you talked about the note that not being able to model likelihood. And as I understand it, the Bayesian's argument to that is, well, you pick something that seems to make sense, and then as you get additional data along the ways, you adjust your likelihood values, and you know the magic of Bayes will just make it all work. So I was uh, interested in your thoughts on that, besides the little dance you just did. <laughs> So I have two thoughts on that. One is <clears throat> that requires that we collect data more frequently and we analyze it and we utilize it and we input it into the models more frequently than we do. Okay, I'm going to put down my water. Show of hands. How many people do assess risk on a daily basis? for their organizations. That's what I thought. How many? You do. Yes, sir. <laughs> All right. If and that's a credible threat. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that was good. I like that. Um, if you're like most organizations, you do a risk assessment on a system or something, so whatever, you, whatever the scope of the assessment is, you're maybe doing it once a year. If you live in a particular, um, in, in some particular government organizations, you're only required to do them formally once every three years. You're supposed to dust it off once a year 
and take a look at it and make sure it still, you know, smells and looks relatively the same. But the, um, but the fact is, you know, we, we just don't have, we have an operational tempo in our, um, in most organizations that prevents us from really truly doing risk assessment as often as we need to. So there's, there's that, there's frequency of getting the data input to refine the model. I think that, and that's, unless you have, again, a worldwide sensor network that is really collecting good data and, can, and has really good visibility. The other thing is that there's, I have a little bit of a concern, and I'm not a mathematician, but I have a little bit of a concern with that, of uh, regression to the mean. And so what you get is you get a sort of an average, but you don't capture any, um, any ends of the bell curve, which could also bite you. Now, you, all, you always, as much as possible, you want to try, to try to hit the middle, but there are some things, and we could talk about that offline if you want, that where you, you want to know what the, what the high, what the right side of the, that curve looks like, because you may get asked about it. Um, are there, how are we doing on time? Two minutes. All right, we have two minutes. Maybe one more quick question or one more quick comment, share. Or we can get out of here two minutes early and I can release you back to the rest of your lives. Oh, yes, sir. Did you go to MIT or Caltech? for you. Um, so, so, we, so we rushed with Department of Commerce pushing everybody into compliance in the late 90s uh, uh, during the Mars worm, during other things as, as we took, uh, as we move forward. So has compliance actually increased this level of risk based on trying to meet a a floor, a minimal floor, instead of actually a ceiling that's specific to each company, making the whole model, you know, non-usable. Yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> right, do we have? To, uh, do, uh, do I have time to, to kind of respond to that? Or? 30 30, 30, okay. So in thirty seconds, thirty seconds or less. And by the way, camera guy, I'm so sorry. I completely screwed you up and told you I was going to sit still, but I, I just can't. Um, okay, so um, I, uh, as everybody hopefully in this room knows, compliance is not security. But my opinion is that, first off, there is no ceiling that, um, that because the, the threat landscape shifts, um, the technology shifts, so there's no ceiling. There's no, there's no such thing as too good of a security program. Um, there is definitely too much security to the point where people can't get their jobs done, but there's not no such thing as a um, too good a security program. Um, the other thing is that, um, in my opinion, even though compliance is not equal security, I would rather have, um, let's call it five to ten percent of something than a hundred percent of nothing to advance security in an organization. That's, that's my humble opinion. So I won't drop the mic. All right, I love that. <laughs> Thanks, everyone.